Hello, this is Father Louis Gertie with part two of Dora's Story. I want to use Rich's book. Dora's Story is a love story uh, about a marriage between two people, Richard and Dora DeLuca. And uh, the first part introduced some aspects of their life together. And now we're going to pick up, they're married. It's going to go back and forth, as you're going to hear. We're going to hear some memories, then forward and so on, because that's the way Dick thinks and, and talks. <laughs> okay, you were married oh, where? Sacred Heart Church, Clifton, New Sacred. Jersey. Okay, and you were married for 57 years. Just close to it, 56 oh. and a half. God bless you. Yes. Thank you. So very soon after you were married, you started planning, we, and I say you, both of you. We just decided we were not going to hold off. We're just going to, and sure enough, ten months after we were married, we had our first child. Ah, wasted no time. That's some great. Of my, some of my friends questioned me whether the, the child wasn't overdue or something, but you know, <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You were you were ready and and planning. No, we, well, uh, I think it's in the book. Uh, here's how ready we were uh, when when we had the ch you know in those days I could not go in to see the birth yes right, so right. I was outside and at one point the, the doctor after a couple of hours the doctor comes in uh, with the baby with my son and my son's looking all over the place he said go see Dora so I walked in and you know, picture this now she's she's in the hospital bed she's she's like this like, big smile on her face what do you think she said to me first thing. When, is, when are we going to have our next one? Wow, that's right. That was, I remember that. And at book. that point, I said to myself, I married the right girl, <laughs> at least in terms of my objectives. <laughs> How many children did you have, siblings, in your family? Four. I was the oldest of four. Okay. And Dora? Dora was the youngest of two. Okay, so her small. She had a brother with, with a neurological problem, so Dora often used to say she felt like she was an only child. And oh. One reason why she wanted to have children Big just more so she enjoyed the pregnancy and the birth so much well, that the first thing out of her mouth was when she, we had she another. enjoyed it but unfortunately every first semester she had she would have like morning sickness which oh, was tough oh, you know yeah, i really yeah, felt yeah, for her yeah, yeah. but she never never complained she just did what she could you know and she, that was her that's great that's great yeah. so okay so now we uh we got married we have. Okay. I, I like the story of looking for your first house. That's hysterical because it was in Wayne eventually, and Wayne was like farmland. That's right. Okay, so go back to Clifton. You're okay, living in Clifton. We're in Clifton. We're there a year and a half. This is Clifton, New Jersey, yes. local town. And our, our our son is a year and a half old, and we said we have enough money now to get a mortgage. So we and we liked Clifton at the time, so we looked around, but the prices were too high. Yeah. So I had a cousin who had just moved to Lincoln Park in okay. a new group, a new development called the Conley Estates. My cousin Murph, Mario De Luca. So he and his wife said to my wife, "What? Come in and look at our place." So we did. We looked it over, but I, I remember it just before we left. I had looked at the paper they, in the real estate, and they said there were some developments coming up in Wayne. Oh. So I suggested to my wife, "Let's cut through Wayne." So I got onto Radzer Road, came down. When I got to the top of the hill. There was a big pasture there with a hill behind it and some cows on the pasture. And in the middle of the pasture, there was this little house. And it's sign saying development. So we parked, we walked in. In the garage, there was a map showing that our street, by the way, is an oval. doesn't go anywhere, which is one reason why we immediately said this has got to be it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, they, I said to the... Realtor, what, what's going on with the big hill here? How are you going to build all those houses? He said, well, the, the houses in the, like on the main, in the front on Ratzer Road and for the first t two sets of houses and the first set of houses on Berkeley Court itself will be on the pasture. But following that, that's where the hill starts getting pushed down. Mm -hmm. And all the houses behind that are built on fill. Oh, so that's one reason we picked our house. Yes, yes. So, secure. <laughs> yeah, secure. And uh, that was the way we got it. Wow. And what year was that? 1957. Okay, now if you look at Wayne today, that, that was pasture land. I mean, I don't think there's room in Wayne to build another. Population was 11,000. Okay, and now what do you think of this? 
55. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's about gone. That. It's about 50,000. Yeah. Wow, yeah, everything good. was pasture. In fact, up and down Radson Road, there were very few houses. Right, right, right. So. Even when I came into Wayne, first teaching at DePaul High School, uh, there were a lot more farmlands on, yes. on Valley Road, even. That's right. And all gone now, it's all homes. Yes. Okay, so let's go back to your first house, uh, and you, f you move in, but there's stories connected to that. Yes, there are. <laughs> See, I think I, I want our audience to know especially young people contemplating marriage, or older people contemplating marriage, it's always going to be a challenge in the beginning, right? I mean, y you have a goal, you have a heart, you're sharing your heart with your spouse and your ch child now, and there's a goal, but sometimes the goals get little uh, barriers. Okay, so tell us well, if I'm, I'm not, we, when we met, when we signed the contract, we were told we would be in by December of 1953. Even then they lied. And, of course, they lied. <laughs> and so we didn't wind up coming in until June, and so we finally made all the arrangements. We had the closing. The, mar the movers were from Patterson. They didn't know where Wayne was, to speak. Of course. So they asked me to direct them, so I drove ahead of them. And when I got to Ratzer Road where the intersection where the street oh, is the, that goes into our court yes. is, there was there were roadblocks there. So I said, "What's going on?" So I I, I said to the movers, "Hang on." So I walked. They were still building a lot of the houses. So I walked back to one of the houses, and the the construction manager, by the way, a big Italian guy named Joe. Joe, I forget his last name, but anyway, he was like this big. I said, "Joe, I got a problem with you." And I said, "What's the matter, Dick?" I said. Um, I made all the arrangements for closing with the lawyers and everybody else. I was told I could move in today, yet you've got to... He said, well, they had just finished paving, so they want us to not to go in for at least a day. I said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm going in yeah, because I'm here. Yeah. And he backed... So he agreed, and then he got his guys to remove the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then when we got there, we found we did not have gas or electricity. Right, uh, you went to the neighbors. It hadn't, it hadn't been connected, <laughs> and... The, the man, the, the house next to us had, had been occupied already, and it was a guy named Joe, and I thought, Joe, uh, what's the name? I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm at the age, where, at close to 87. God bless my you. senior minutes are becoming senior moments, but anyway, you know. <laughs> That's all right. That's senior, right. senior moments are becoming senior. Yeah. Anyway, Paul Florida, he was great. He came over, he said, listen, can I help you? I said, you know, Paul, I have a problem. <laughs> what they haven't hooked us up with, with electricity. Or, or I'm not worried about the gas. This is June. But he so he oh he and he was a supervisor in two guys from Harrison. Oh, another old story. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. he brought in a whole bunch of extension cords, and he actually brought extension Stop cords it. to my house Stop and gave it. me enough electricity for so we'd have light. <laughs> and then since we didn't have gas, my wife said, "Go go to two guys from Harrison, buy a, a, a charcoal burner." Yeah, yeah. Oh, and for the next week or two, and before until we got gas, every morning now, Dora would get up early. She'd make me breakfast on that charcoal. She's burner. amazing, amazing. That's God how far she went bless for me. God bless which tells you. Oh. I lucked out when it came to women choosing women. I'm she was you. a gem. God bless you. And of course, I was lucked out. Of course, she chose me over. By the way, the guy she was going with was from a wealthy family. She chose me over some wealth, and she she chose a guy who was just in his first job, was making like six thousand dollars a year. <laughs> I, okay, I, I have to interrupt. As a marriage and family therapist, there's so many things you're saying. I have to just interrupt. Okay, one expect setbacks when you're buying your new home or going forward. Expect setbacks, but don't get caught in the setbacks, as you heard Rich uh, talk about. Also. Choose wisely who you're going to marry. Don't marry his or her pocketbook or wallet. Marry the heart, the soul, the person, and get to know them, not because of the looks only, but the whole person, as you hear Rich did and he has profited so well from. Okay, beautiful. Um, you don't mind me interrupting you, right? No, no, no. <laughs> There's two interruptions back and forth. Okay, um, so you got into your house with electric cords, extensions, yeah. and all that, and you, and you finally moved in. Yeah. And you had one child at that point. Yes. And you're still living in that same house. Yes. Not only me. Great. In fact, uh, next week it will be 60 years. On wow. June 27th, I will be in this house 60 years. June 27, 2017, 60 years in that house. Yes. That's great. And you raised how many children? There? Eight. Mm. That's great. I remember we, we were originally a three-bedroom house. Two, yeah. And, but when my we were having our sixth child, we decided, we expanded. 
we added two more bedrooms, and a you know, bathroom, and all that stuff. So, so that's fantastic. That was, although, interestingly, if you look to our, our development, for a while we were the biggest house in the neighborhood. But over the last twenty years, with all these Mac mansions, yeah, yeah, on, yeah, yeah, including some of our neighbors, yeah, I yeah. got the smallest. Ah, <laughs> that's all right. That's it. <laughs> Which I don't mind. It's that's fine. good. Less the clean. <laughs> Okay, so uh, tell me, you refer, refer back to your job, but what were you doing then? What was your Okay, uh, I was a systems analyst. Well, <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be, but anyway, because my major was industrial relations. And that's a whole other story, which I don't want to get into. Uh, but I was a systems analyst. Uh, I, well, I started as a, a, a budget analyst okay. only because... They weren't, 54 happened to be a recession year. I, I was having trouble getting my first job, and Curtis Wright offered me this position, so I said, okay. So I took the job, but after about six months, my boss said to me, you know what, I think you, you can be, you can do better work, so I'll make you a systems analyst. By the way, when he told me that, I said, what's a systems analyst? Yeah. Because it's 1954. I, I don't know what it is today. Well, in Tell 54, me. systems analysis was a relatively upcoming oh, new profession. Oh, oh, oh. Interesting. So I became a systems analyst. And basically. what did you do? Tell me, just in the sense. A lot of, lot of problem solving. For example, okay. they had a problem, they had a problem with... Um, getting changes made and then coordinating the dates at which certain models of like aircraft engines mm -hmm. would start using the change part. So I basically modified the information system so that everybody w it would be coordinated so they'd all know exactly when we do we mark the change and how do we do it so that we don't make a mistake. Excellent, excellent. Because there were technical reasons that Sure. Eventually, how did you get involved with William Patterson? It was college then, well, I know. Well, okay, well, when I was working, after I got my MBA, I started doing some adjunct teaching because mm -hmm. I liked it. Yeah, in what field? In business, business. management, yeah, because okay. I was I was systems <laughs> analyst, then I was a management analyst, and then I became, I get into management, and so I always taught business courses, mostly management. So so I started teaching for William Patterson as an adjunct right. when I was actually, I was actually the Director of Planning Services for the New York Stock Exchange at that time. Whoa. <laughs> but I started teaching for them in 1976. Excellent. Now, by 1982, I had changed, I had left them and I had gone to another company as an officer. Right. I was with them about four years and they, they decided to, and I was still teaching adjunct, by the way. Okay. Although, and uh, so, but they had a change in management I didn't like, and my wife said to me, Richard, I know you love teaching. Why don't you just teach? I said, Dora, if I, if I go to teach, our income is going to be cut in half. By the way, at that point, she was just about finishing her studies for a, a BA in elementary education. Oh, okay. Right, right. Because eventually she got into education. And then in 1978, yeah, yeah. she got into that, in fact. So she, by then, she was actually working as a school teacher. That's great. And so I said, well, okay, if you work as a school teacher and I'm just as an instructor, what I'll do is during the summers, I'll do some consulting. Okay. And that's what I did. Good, good, good. In fact, I was previously to that, I had developed a sort of a reputation as a, pro as a project, as a seminar leader for courses in project management, which was a big part of my background. Excellent, excellent. And, excellent. and so I did that during the summer. I would be all over the place giving mm -hmm, a seminar. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, if you hear some growling in the background, that's mm -hmm. Santana. Santana. Come over here. Come on over here. She's looking out the window. She wants to go out. Come on, come on over here. No? Okay. She just wants the sound. So if you hear it, that little growling sound, it's her looking out the window because she wants to run after squirrels. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You never had pets? We had, yeah, we, we, uh, we wound up getting a dog by mistake. Oh. What happened was one day where my kids are out in the backyard and they see some, tr some car pulled in. The door opened and they pushed the dog out. No. And it was a beagle. Oh, a female and she's beagle. a puggle. Okay. Half beagle, half puggle. And so all the kids got to like it, and the beetle wound up settling on the some white blue, blue spruce trees. And we found out then she was a female and that she had mated with the dog next door. And so I wound up putting a little fence around to protect her. And, and of course, then we decided, okay, all the kids said, let's adopt one of them. <laughs> I wanted to adopt the mother because she was really so nice. But the kids said, no, we'll, we'll adopt them. And the door actually went to visit a bunch of neighbors and friends of hers and actually managed to find homes for the other three pups. Now, she kept the <laughs> She fourth. was always a mother. <laughs> and on top of that, to make sure that the mother, who we couldn't keep, 
would would certainly would be given a place rather than euthanize or something. She found a place in Montclair that said, if you just pay to have her spayed, we will guarantee a home. And so she took the dog all the way to Montclair, got it spayed, and then... God bless I mean, That was her, you know, always yes. got to be sure it's good for somebody else. That Okay, let's get into that, and, and then we'll pick, pick that whole section up in, in another segment. Okay. Um, who are we talking about? T- tell us about Dora. To tell us her heart and her, uh, her loving uh, personality. She was a woman who never was outwardly very emotional. I mean, you always showed pleasure or excitement, but she was not the you know typical stereotype. The Italians they have. Yeah, yeah. Not no, no, no. She was, was she not was, Dora. She was very calm. Yeah, she yeah. had this tremendously. A beautiful, smooth voice that calmed you down right away, no matter who. Even if she was it's angry, true. occasionally we would argue. And by the way, one of our, one of the agreements we made even before we got married is we will never argue in front of the children. Our children Stop never right. heard us argue. Stop right there! Did you hear that? I'm going to ask Dick to say that again. All parents, listen to this. We agreed before we married that when we were raising our children, we would never argue in front of them. This we is would be- save the arguing for later, and this we is, did. This is before they even had children. And we did argue a number of times, I'll tell you. Okay, but that's they never life. That's life. The children absorb everything. And the biggest fear when parents argue for children is stability. They lack that's stability. Right. Exactly. They Because I always tell my clients, kids associate family with this. The house, the dog, the pet, mom and dad, and security. When you argue, they don't know enough that it's a mature argument or not. They absorb it, and they absorb anxiety and fear, and it goes into their hearts and souls. Please do not argue in front of your children. Make an appointment. Let's go upstairs. Let's go downstairs. Let's go neighbor. Let's go have a cup of coffee outside. Not in front of the kids, because it teaches bad communication skills. Uh, A serious discussion with the family over issues that are hot topics, appropriate. With the family, everybody. Right. We did many, much, much of that. To tell us, to tell us, good. Yeah, you're a good example. <clears throat> okay, well, for example, we we wanted to. Uh, <clears throat> we always wanted to make sure our kids saw a lot of features and were visited a lot of places. So we always planned trips, and we always would would have them involved. For example, we say, okay, do you want to go to Gettysburg or do you want to go to Amish country? Mm, and mm. we would tell them a little bit about each one, have them even look it up, the good, older ones, look good, it up, good. see what it's all about. You tell us what you want to do, and then we'd come to an agreement, and we would do that. Beautiful family and So, system. you know, that's how when we, we felt the children have to be part of, they have to know that we, 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 we value their opinions. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm going to stop there because it's so important for the family system to let everybody in the family know that their opinions are valued, and they're valued as individuals. We forget that. We forget that when when people want to, adults regrettably look somebody someplace else, and and their emotions get involved with somebody outside the house. Right. They forget these are kids that you made these kids, and they your prime responsibility to protect them, love them, and model role model for them. Okay, um, we got a little bit of uh, sermonettes here, but that's right. You, this is therapy that you're not paying for. Thank you for joining us. This is Father Louis Skirty with Friends of the Word, and my email is frfatherlouisskirty at hotmail.com. Would you like to have your email located? Uh, if not, uh, when you do, I'll put it on the byline. Okay, you can on. put it on the yeah. byline. Yeah, and I'll send you Rich's uh, email. And the book we're talking about is Dora's Story, and there are many aspects to the story. You can tell me something. Did, did you have something? No, I just want to say, uh, by the way, if Dora knew we were doing this, she would be th- sending a thundercloud down <laughs> because Dora was very, she was the most humble person I ever knew. You asked my children. In fact, some of them is in here. Yes, yes. By some of her friends also who said she, she, was, she was superior in many ways. And she knew, and she didn't need anybody to tell her. Yeah, that's she great. She really didn't need anybody to tell her. When you're secure, you're and secure. Plus, she just didn't, didn't like people talking about her. That's great. Sorry, Dora. God bless you. Rest in peace and watch over your family. This Thank is Father Lou. Me. We'll be back with Friends of the Word with another segment of Dora's Story. Thank you.